In November 2014, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau Division of Healthy Start and Perinatal Services hosted the 2014 Healthy Start Convention, a new era of Healthy Start, emphasizing quality and planning for success. This is a recording of the Implementing Evidence-Based Practices Plenary, featuring Dr. Jan Shepard and Estreita Lowberry, President and CEO of ReachUp, Inc., and the Project Director of the Central Hillsboro Healthy Start. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we are moving on to the I in EPIC, and we're going to look this morning at implementing evidence-based practice. I know it sounds kind of dry and technical, right, for 8.30 on a Thursday morning, but if you look at the pictures of the people up there, they represent our participants. And you know, this is all about them. And what I will do is focus on them and how we can use evidence-based practice to enhance our care of them. So these are my objectives. First of all, going to do the hard part. We're going to look at the definition of evidence-based practice. You know, we've all thrown that term around for three day, two days now, three, some of you. In fact, yesterday I was sitting in the back and every speaker mentioned evidence-based many times but nobody really described it, and nobody really talked about what it is and how we develop it. And then there are also levels of evidence that you want to be aware of, so I'm going to be looking at these things. But the focus is always on our participants. I mean, I'm a frontline practitioner like you all. I'm out there with the people, and that's what I really care about, and that's what I'm going to focus on. But before we do anything, I want to share a little historical perspective on evidence-based practice. So this is like before evidence-based. And this is several centuries ago. You can tell by the way the lady's dressed. And she's not feeling very well. You can tell by her face. So she called the doctor, and the doctor brought over treatment for her. And here it is, this vial of treatment that she is supposed to apply to her skin, and this will hopefully make her better. So, here's a little picture of what she's applying to her skin. Looks kind of yucky. And what is it? It is leeches, yeah. So that's before evidence-based, because you couldn't find any evidence that leeches work. So why did people think leeches work? They thought leeches work for the two reasons we think we thought before evidence-based that a lot of things worked. One of the reasons is we've always done it that way. We've always used leeches. You know, it must work, or why did we always use it? And you know, as human beings, we're creatures of habit. So if we've used something, it seems like the right thing to keep using it. It almost becomes a dogma. But there may be nothing behind it. So the first reason is we've always done it, and the second reason is the experts said it worked. Because she called a doctor, and the doctor brought these, you know? And the doctor was taught by his professor that they worked, and his professor was taught by his professor, and it kept going down. But the experts aren't always right. We need to question that. And if you question the leeches, and if you look for evidence, you wouldn't find it. <clears throat> but, you know, even in modern medicine, until recently, we haven't focused on evidence. We've done these very two same things. We've looked at what we've always done, and we've listened to the experts. And now we look at evidence, and sometimes it contradicts what we've always done. So I want to look at the beginning of evidence-based, and you can probably trace it back to the mid-1800s. And one of the people you could trace it back to is a Dr. John Snow that you see right there. Now, you've probably heard us talking. I heard several people mention this yesterday, JSI. JSI is the organization that's sponsoring EPIC. What's JSI stand for? John Snow Institute. So it's named after John Snow, and that's appropriate because we're talking evidence-based, and he's one of the major people that helped us start to look at evidence as far as caring for people. So let me tell you a little bit about John Snow. He was practicing in London back in the 1850s. And London had a big problem with recurrent cholera epidemics. 
I mean, hundreds of people would die. Thousands of people would die. These epidemics would sweep through the city. And people thought, the legend was, that this was caused by the miasma in London, basically the air. And the air wasn't very good because you had like open sewage going through the streets, you had horses going by doing what they do. The air wasn't very good. So they sort of intuited, ah, the air's the problem. And when cholera came around, everybody closed their shutters, so couldn't get in my house, you know? And then there were some other people, particularly some preachers, that said, you know, there's a lot of bad behavior going on in London these days, and this is God's punishment. So that was another theory. But John Snow, he didn't buy either one of those theories. He said, the cholera is coming from the water. But nobody believed him, so he looked for evidence. And what he did was, he took a map of his neighborhood, it was called Soho, he took a map, and he went around to all the houses in his neighborhood and found out who got cholera. And if a whole family got it, they got a big dot on there. If one person got it, there's a little dot. But what you could see was that they all kind of centered around a little blue dot right here. It's kind of almost a target around that little blue dot. That little blue dot turned out to be the water pump. Because these people did not have running water, of course, they all had to go out to the pump in their neighborhood to get any water that they would get. So all these people were using that pump, and he said, ha, huh, I've got some evidence that it's the water. But that wasn't enough. So the next thing he did was, went to the pump, here it is, famous pump, you can see it in London if you want. And he went to the pump and he took off the handle. So people could not get water from this pump anymore. And cholera in that neighborhood stopped. More evidence, right? So this made a big difference, although it took him a while to convince people he had to go to other neighborhoods, carry out his study again. But the beginning of evidence-based, and we can see how different that is from just guessing. It was not the miasma or even God. So I want to tell you about a newer piece of evidence that changed some things we have thought in women's health. Because we've still got this going on, and it's turning things around. So this is a study that looked at contraception. And you know, birth control pills have been out since 1960. And we, when they came, it was a miracle that we had something that effective and that easy. And ever since then, people have thought, well, that's the best thing we've got. And it's been the number one thing women in our country use for contraception by far. But now we've got some data from a project called the Choice Project. This project is being done in St. Louis. I imagine there's some people from St. Louis here. And they should be very proud of this study. This study enrolled women who needed contraception. And what they did was they put ads out in every medium that you could possibly think of. If you are between age 14 and 45 and you don't want to get pregnant for three years, and you would like free birth control, come be in our study. Well, this was before Obamacare made contraception free for a lot of people, so people had to pay a lot for contraception. 9,500 women came in. So they had a good study going, you know. And then what they did when the women came in, each one of them was counseled about every method of contraception known to women. I mean, from diaphragm to pill to IUD, everything. And you could pick choice. And whatever you picked, you would get it free for three years. And then, after the years went by, they looked at the pregnancy rates with the different methods. And birth control pills, that's always been our standard, the best thing we've got, we thought. But 4.27% of the women that chose it got pregnant. I mean, that's pretty good. But the women who chose IUDs or the implant in the arm, 0.27% got pregnant. Whoa, that's the best thing we've got. And this opened our eyes to that. In fact, those long-acting methods, we call them LARC now, long-acting reversible contraception, was 22 times more effective than the pill. So here we are thinking we've got the panacea with the pill, but the panacea is actually these things. And it's changed the way we look at contraception when we got evidence. 
Now, of course, you can kind of guess why that's true, because it's easy to forget your pills, and you got a long-acting method that's there all the time, but still, important information based on evidence. So here's our formal definition of evidence-based practice. I know you've all been waiting for this. This comes from AHRQ. And obviously, evidence-based practice is the use of the best available evidence. But then notice there's a couple other parts of this definition that aren't always appreciated, and that is together with provider's expertise and clients' values and preferences in making healthcare decisions. So the important thing to realize is evidence base is a great way to find good resources that will work, maybe, for you. But it's not the be all and end all. There's two other things to take into account. And one is provider's expertise. That's you all. That's you all and the folks you work with. And you might find an evidence-based practice, and this looks really good in the study. But you look at that and you say, you know, that's not going to work in my clientele. I have experience, I have expertise, and this, this, this isn't for us. And that's fine. Nobody's going to say, you have to do this evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practices are out there for you to adopt, and you decide which ones will work in your setting. And then the other piece, it's a triple, it's a triad, really. The other piece is the client's values and preferences, of course. We're not going to force something down the client's throat either. If she still wants birth control pills, of course she's going to get them. We learn some things are more effective, but it's about her values. It's about her religion sometimes, her culture sometimes, her region of the country. So evidence-based, really important. We want to employ evidence-based practices, practices that have been studied, but we also want to customize them to where we are, and that's where you all come in, because you are the experts. So how do we generate evidence? Well, there's two ways, basically. The best way is a randomized controlled trial. Any of all known about those, basically you have two group, you have a big group of people, and half get the intervention and half don't, randomly assigned between which they get, and you see how the outcome. You check for the outcome. And if it works, you're going to see. The group that got it, it did better. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the group that got it does worse. But that's your randomized controlled trial. That's the gold standard, the best way to study something. An example that's been studied that way is the Nurse Family Partnership. Imagine a lot of you are aware of that program. That's been studied in three areas of the country, three diverse areas, in hundreds of women and babies. And they have compared group women that didn't get it with women that did get it. These are first-time, low-income moms, and it's about home visitation, home visiting nurses. Recommendation is 60 visits over prenatal and postpartum. But this has been compared with women who got this, women who didn't get it, and the interesting thing about this study is it's been going on for a long time. In one center, it's been going on since the 70s. In other centers, it's been going on since the 90s. So we can show, in fact, comparing the two groups, gold standard, that not only are the pregnancies better that got nurse family partnership, not only are the babies healthier, not only do the children do better in school, but some of these children are now adults. And they're functioning better as adults as well. This is huge. They can show they're less likely to get in trouble with the law. The women are less likely to have unintended pregnancies. They use Medicaid less because they're employed more. So this is gold standard, randomized controlled trial, and look how it turned out. Now, sometimes we can't do a randomized controlled trial. It's not practical. So then we do what we call an observational study. For example, Jon Snow, you know, he's pretty sure that the collar was in the water. So he can't really do a controlled trial. You know, you guys have to drink the water, and you drink some other water, and we'll see who gets sick. You know, not really practical, not ethical. Can't do it. So he just had to look and see what happened with who he had. Choice studies the same way. You can't tell women to come in, and you get a diaphragm, and you get an IUD, and you get a pill. You know, you can't do that. We will quit the study real quick, especially if they got the diaphragm, probably. 
The other thing you couldn't do is have a control group that didn't get birth control at all, right? Drastic consequences there. So sometimes you just have to observe what happens, let people choose, and observe what happens. And if you have enough people and good statisticians, you can get good results from that as well. So a little bit about how we do the studies. And this is going to look familiar to you because I know a lot of you have been talking about QI here, quality improvement. And it's really very, very similar. We first ask the question, what are we trying to accomplish? Maybe we want to decrease preterm birth in our population. How we know that a change is an improvement? Well, hopefully we got two groups. We're going to give the intervention to some. We're not going to give it to others. And we're going to look at the rate of preterm birth. And then we got to figure out what our intervention is. And then something else that looks really familiar to you, the PDSA cycle. And we use it in QI, but we also use it in research. The plan is what we just talked about. You set up your study. Then you carry out your study. That's the do. Then your study. You analyze the data. And then you act. And if it shows you something worked, that's great. You start doing it. But you're never done. It's that same cycle. It's that same cycle. So if it's, you seem like it worked, let's try it on more people. Let's try it on different kinds of people. John Snow, he finished. He found out what worked in his neighborhood. But then to really prove that it was the water, he had to go to different neighborhoods, keep expanding it. That's really where you're going to get the proof. So PDSI cycle just keeps appearing. And here it is for evidence-based. One more thing you want to know about evidence, and that is the levels of evidence. You want to be aware of this. And there are three levels. And really, only level one can we truly call evidence-based practice, because these are the things that we have really, really rigorously shown to be true. And they're level one. So what do we mean? Well, often there's double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. There's all kinds of randomization and trials in different settings all over the country. So you can say that if, if it only was in Miami, you might say, well, it's warm there. That's why they did well. Or if it only was in Denver, where I'm from, maybe it's the mountain air. You know, But you've got to do it a bunch of places, a bunch of places, and get the same results everywhere on different populations. Control group, really important. And then you see that that intervention works everywhere. And then the experts review that evidence. And they say, well, I wasn't part of that study, but boy, I'm convinced. And when that happens, it often gets published in a peer-reviewed journal. Further evidence that this is level one. So level one is what we wish we had for every one of our needs. But we don't always have level one evidence. We're still developing evidence for a lot of things. So sometimes we go to level two. And level two is promising approaches, and that matters too. These are things that people are trying out in the field. Experts are trying out in the field, and they seem to be working. You know, we've <coughs> tried it in our group, and the group that didn't get it didn't do as well. Ooh, that's looking good. And now we're doing a little bigger study. But it's looking good. Or now we've even done a couple, but we haven't done on different populations. Experts haven't reviewed it. But it's looking good. And if you can't find a level one practice for your needs, go with level two, because these are promising. Finally, we have level three. And level three is about the experts, experts coming up with things. But the experts are coming up with these things based on evidence. And then they're kind of putting them all together, the evidence that they've got, and they're adding their two cents into how they all work together and coming up with guidelines, protocols, and tools. So these are, of course, important, too. And especially because many of the groups putting out these guidelines are people like the American Academy of Pediatrics or the CDC. And they are putting together a bunch of evidence-based guidelines. So level one, level two, level three, when you employ an evidence-based practice, you want to know which kind of evidence you're talking about, and you hope it could be level one. But if not, be aware, level two or level three. I just want to mention one more thing about the importance of evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practice is the most important thing going on in medicine, for sure, 
which is my field, but really throughout care of people. And because of that, there is now a government agency for healthcare research and quality that is in charge of being sure we do produce evidence and that the evidence is good and that the evidence is accessible to everybody. And the mission of AHRQ is to focus particularly on improving healthcare quality, making healthcare safer, increasing accessibility, and improving affordability, efficiency, and cost transparency. So I mentioned them because we're now going to look at some of the practices, and many of these practices we found on AHRQ website because they, they actually are collecting the evidence and making it available to people. So let's look at some evidence-based practice, and I want to organize it by the way we have been organizing things, the four Ps. So we're going to look at one practice for preconception, interconception, one for prenatal, one for postpartum, and one for parenting. Start out with the preconception. So this is a program called Choices, and it's particularly aimed at women who are maybe heavy drinkers and not using good contraception. And of course, what this is aimed at is preventing fetal alcohol syndrome. So this is a program that gives women who enroll in it four 45-minute motivational interview sessions regarding their alcohol use and one contraceptive counseling and provision visit. But we have excellent evidence for this program. This program has been studied at six sites around the country involving 830 women. 415 got the program. The other 415 didn't get ignored. I mean, they came to the center and they got materials about alcoholism and fetal alcohol syndrome. They got materials about contraception. They got referrals. But they didn't get the program. People that got the program got all of that plus the program. And the outcome was the people that got the program were half as likely to have a baby with fetal alcohol syndrome. That's big. That's a huge result. And there was a lot of women affected by that. So this is included in the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. But this is an example of a wonderful program with excellent evidence behind it. What about prenatal? Well, there's text for baby. How many of you know about text for baby? Yeah, this is a wonderful program too, evidence-based. I love this because, boy, every young woman I know is on her cell phone all the time texting, right? I look at my waiting room. That's what everybody's doing. <laughs> so this is great because this is a way to approach young women with text. And as you know, it's a free program, three texts a week. And information on prenatal care, reminders of prenatal appointments, information on nutrition, reminders about immunizations, information about breastfeeding, exercise, family violence, mental health, signs of labor. So what kind of evidence do we have for this program? Well, they've followed women who use text for baby, and they are three times as likely to say they're prepared for labor, they're prepared to have a baby, they're prepared to be a mom. This is big. And I don't know how prepared they really are, who's really prepared for labor and being a mom. But they say they're prepared, and they're certainly more prepared than their cohorts. But the other thing they can document is women that use text for baby are more likely to follow through on prenatal care, more likely to take prenatal vitamins, less likely to drink, smoke, or do drugs in pregnancy, more likely to get immunizations. So this is a wonderful evidence-based program, and I, I know you're familiar with it, but it's an example of what evidence can prove why we're doing this. And this, of course, is included in the CDC Guide to Strategies to Support Mothers and Babies. What about postpartum? Well, there's a lot of concerns postpartum, but one of the big ones is helping women breastfeed. Very important. And our goal, of course, for women to breastfeed for six months at least, sometimes hard to achieve. So this is an evidence-based tool regarding breastfeeding. 
And this is available online. It's also available as a booklet. It's a program called Breastfeeding Support, Evidence-Based Clinical Practice Guideline, obviously. But it is a wonderful tool as well. And it includes anything you ever want to know about breastfeeding, basically. It was developed by OBGYN nurses. And you go on and you find charts, pages and pages of charts with columns of every issue that a woman could face about breastfeeding. It starts with prenatal counseling. And it's about, you talk to her and she's kind of negative about it. And you find out it's because her mom and her grandmother are kind of negative about it. Well, there's evidence-based advice of how you can help her and how you can convince her. And there's even a referral that you can read up more about where they got that evidence. What if she's got inverted nipples, something like that? Well, there's evidence for that. Prenatal. Postpartum, it's divided into the first two weeks and then the first six months. And it deals with everything from nipple pain to going back to work and how you're going to manage breastfeeding. How you're going to manage breastfeeding with sex. How you're going to manage it with your other children. It's all on there. And evidence-based. Tells you what to do. Tells you where the evidence came from. So this is from the National Institute for Children's Health Quality. Again, important information available, and it's not made up. It's not what people always do. The experts just didn't put it on us. It's proven. Finally, for parenting, there's legacy for children. Another. These are all just examples. They're nothing you have to do, but they're all good examples. So legacy for children is an excellent one and is now partnering right with the Healthy Start program. That's why you all got a paper about Legacy for Children in your program. And this is a wonderful program. So this, I love the philosophy of this program. You know, I'm an obstetrician and have watched many women go through labor, delivery, and raising their children. And of course, what's the most important thing probably that can exist for a little baby is the mother-infant bond. Huge, huge. And that's what this program is based on. But it's also based on the fact that every mother-infant bond is different. Everyone is unique. Every mother develops her own type of bond based on who she is, her personality, her setting. But it can always be done no matter what your circumstances. It's the other big piece of philosophy in this program. So what this program is, as you have probably read on your paper there, is weekly meetings for women postpartum. Some, some programs have actually begun prenatally, sometimes postpartum. Weekly meetings of moms. And sometimes the babies are included in the meetings, sometimes they're not. But the idea of the meetings is for moms to set goals for their children and figure how they're going to achieve them. And every mom's goals are different. Then nobody's going to tell them what to do. There's a facilitator to help them decide what to do. But it's all about them. There's counseling for them. And this has, is evidence-based. It's been studied in Miami. It's been studied in LA. 300 moms in both places. And in both places, some got the program, some did not. And they were able to show that the ones who got the program, their children had better language skills, had better people skills, had fewer behavioral problems, did better in school, were healthier. So this is a very exciting program. And I know many of you are going to be interested in implementing it in your regions. Again, just a bunch of evidence-based programs. They can pick. It's not everybody has to do, but it's sampling of the kind of evidence we're talking about and the kind of programs that are available. Finally, I want to show you how the EPIC plan is going to help you use evidence-based practice. And you're going to see the EPIC website come up in January. And on the EPIC website, there's going to be a search function to find evidence-based practices. So you're doing your needs assessment. You find you have a need. You go on here. They are categorized by the P's. So we talk in a prenatal program. We talk in a postpartum program. And under that, they're categorized further. For example, postpartum. Is it breastfeeding? Is it depression? Is it something else? And you can use this search function and find an evidence-based practice to fill that need that you found. And the evidence-based practices are leveled one, two, or three. 
Level one evidence is what you want if you can get it, and if you can't, you'll go with two or three. Now, you may find an intervention that sounds really good, but uh, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. And that's where also, on the EPIC website, you can arrange for training. You can arrange for individual technical assistance to help you adopt these evidence-based practices. And finally, we know that you all are the experts. And so you want to employ evidence-based practice, that's for sure. I hope I've convinced you about that. But the other thing is we are hoping that you all being the experts and being out there with many, many participants, you can begin to generate evidence as well. And of course, generating evidence is hugely important because if you generate evidence, then it's not just for your area, it's for everybody in Healthy Start. And it's not just for Healthy Start, it's for everybody eventually. Everybody in the country could benefit. And not only that, of course, if it gets published, future people can benefit as well. So we're looking at a big picture with the EPIC plan, but it's all based on evidence-based practice. And of course, the goal is always, as you know, a healthy start for every child. Thank you. Now we will hear from Estreita Lowberry, President and CEO of ReachUp, Inc., and the Project Director of the Central Hillsboro Healthy Start. She will speak about implementing evidence-based and promising practices in her Healthy Start program. Great, great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shepard, and uh, that uh, point, two points, the focus on the practitioner and the focus on the, um, the focus, um, uh, the consumer at large, and also that the evidence-based practices, while it's critically important and integral in what we do, it is certainly not the be-all, end-all. And um, I just want to say greetings, Healthy Star family. Good morning. Good morning. Mm -mm. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I, I do extend greetings from the Sunshine State, Tampa, Florida. Special shout out to my Florida Federal Network. Um, and I'm really excited to be here as uh, a respondent, as a grantee, and further, further have a conversation about how a Healthy Start site and how we can further walk the walk. And so in Hillsborough County, I always like to give regards to the really hard work, and we've been talking about collective impact and uh, been talking about coalescing and mobilizing our communities and our stakeholders uh, to move that needle. And in the community that I come from, Hillsborough County, we've been very blessed and very fortunate. Uh, we, as a collective, have been able to uh, change and move that needle in, uh, since not, from 1998 to 2010, we really have made an impact in reducing infant mortality by 52%. Y'all can give us a round of applause. I, I, I know we're not the only ones, but that's the goal to move the needles, and our goal is by uh, year 2025, we would say we will have zero infant mortality, and we believe that we can do that. So in demonstrating uh, some of our efforts, uh, two things that we like to speak about really briefly and why it's important uh, to do this when you're talking about evidence-based uh, practices. So you want to be very careful and strategic in choosing and implementing. And so for us, um, we're, it's important to have those community-driven asset mapping and assessments. And we went into details in some of the sessions about that yesterday. For us, um, that includes <clears throat> partnering again. Uh, we actually utilize for our community needs assessment our Title V needs assessment, which is our five-year assessment. We have our local health system action plan uh, that has been a mandate by the federal uh, uh, grant. Um, and we also have our local interagency management team. So we actually incorporate and integrate three different formal plans into one to become our plan for our disparities. Uh, then we talked a lot already about the appropriate evidence-based models and choosing those. So tailoring is critically important because one size doesn't fit all. And the key and the idea for us is to 
remember we have options and it's always good to have options. And so in choosing your options and choosing your tailoring to fit, uh, take note of these items that you have here, which is the culture sensitivity. We all know about uh, dissemination potential. Uh, can't say enough about working to produce and to um, you know, uh, publish your work and your efforts. Uh, we are fortunate in having a lead evaluator uh, who have been integral in public, publishing the works of uh, our Healthy Start site, and that's Dr. Hamasu Salihu. And uh, in a period of four years, we've published 11 peer-reviewed publications about our work. Y'all can give us a hand clap again. We're, we're, we're so excited about the publications. And I, I have to give a shout out to Dean Peterson because uh, at the College of Public Health at USF when she came, she said, Lo, you got this community coalescing mobilization thing going on. You, you guys are doing it really well. What is it you want us to do? What is it, how can I affect change for you and what you all are doing? And I said to her, Dean, help us get published. She said, got you, and she did just that. Um, so effectiveness is important, and then not enough to say about the community input. Healthy Start, new, old, Healthy Start together. One of the things to keep in mind and keep in the forefront is that what is unique and genuine about the Healthy Start system is our level of involvement with consumers and the recipients that we serve. So everything that we do the recipients of services, in addition to the stakeholders and the funders, should be at the forefront of our planning, our developing, and our implementing our, our strategies. And for the fidelity to making sure that you holding your feet to the fire has to be formalized processes. For us, it's a quality improvement, quality assurance director, it's my management team, and it's Ken Scarborough, who many of y'all know. <laughs> So it's important to hold your feet to the fire regarding the fidelity, holding your word, doing what you said you're gonna do when you're utilizing a model. And uh, you all know about sustainability, how critically important that is. For our pre interconception period, we, uh, our community uh, chose to do social media campaign. The young ladies that you see here are, peer, uh, are preconception peer educators from the University of South Florida and the Office of Minority Health. This is one of their initiatives across the country. And so with their leadership and our recipients of services, we have created um, um, a, a campaign to improve healthy eating, uh, driven, about, driven by some of the data that we collected around our health and obesity issues. And so we've had the focus groups, the analysis, uh, draft media and community feedback and a formalized community feedback loop. Um, and as a result, we now have many billboards, bus bench ads, posters, and palm cards. On the buses, they look so good and they got so many compliments, they're still running it for free. <laughs> and then in the prenatal period, we have the nurse family partnership uh, that the doctor talked to. We have that home visitor model for us is pretty new. Uh, we've had that model for now one year. So we're, we're learning as we grow, but the, the good thing about the NFP model is that it is for the first, uh, first time um, uh, moms. And uh, our budget for that, when you're talking sustainability and trying to leverage more funding, our budget for that is uh, 450,000. Uh, the nurse family partnership a visiting model is one, the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Screen, which uh, many of you uh, utilize that screen, and as you know, there are several other screens, uh, but it has now been validated for both pre- and postnatal depression. And then the Strong Start model, uh, which is one of those promising practices. Uh, we have the Strong Start model, which is also just one year old as well, and that budget is about $260,000. It gives us an opportunity to be in the clinic offices in our community. So we're in three clinic offices in our communities uh, to work with the moms with risk screening, um, maternal health education, medication self-management, 
uh, pregnancy, disease, and chronic illness, and postpartum services. And in the postpartum period, we have, as you said, the Edinburgh, as we said. And um, in parenting category, we have the 24-7 Dad, the Promise and Practice National Fatherhood Initiative. That is also a new program for us. Uh, 2012 to 2013, we enrolled 43 dads. 21 completed the curriculum. In 2013 to 24, we enrolled 66 dads and 44 completed curriculum, and 11 is continuing. Give us a round of applause for that, too. We're really excited about that. So uh, in closing, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, I know that uh, we've had a lot of conversation over the past couple of days about collective impact. Um, it is so important for us to realize the intellectual capital among us. And it's so important to realize that as we move forth and look forward to the growth and expansion, do not lose sight on your skill sets and your ability to do this, because uh, we have to do this. This is not an option. I look forward to working with all of the partners, because we're in it to win it and we most certainly will. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Implementing Evidence-Based Practices Plenary from the 2014 Maternal and Child Health Bureau Healthy Start Convention. For access to the slides and more information on this topic, please visit www.healthystartepic.org.